as the regulations. Now, I'm working off a slightly different bundle, but I can't give you a page number to the bundle. It's it's page 11, Justice. I do have it. You have it. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Now, the regulations govern, obviously, um, the matter together with the provisions of the Act. The regulations are not challenged by anyone and have not been challenged by anyone, so they stand. I've already made the submission that these regulations were approved by Parliament. The content of Regulation 29A is dispositive, we submit, of the respondent's case and indicates in um, unambiguous terms why the DA and the other applicants are correct in their approach to the matter. Um, sorry, one provision that I omitted to draw to your attention in my discussion of the architecture of the Act is Section 6.5 of the uh, Correctional Services Act. That is a section which I'm sure the Court would be well aware of and familiar with, which requires, as soon as possible after admission, the undergoing of a health status examination by every inmate who is admitted into a correctional facility. They must undergo a medical examination as soon as possible after admission. That is required by Section 6.5. Now, we can accept, Justice, that Mr. Zuma, I think the papers, in fact, advert to this, <clears throat> underwent such an examination. So, Regulation 29A1 says, if it is established by the health status examination as contemplated in Section 6.5 of the Act, or any subsequent health status examination that a sentence, a sentence offender is suffering from a condition of which the prognosis indicates a condition listed in subregulation 5, such facts must be recorded. Then two, an application for medical parole in terms of section 79.2 of the Act. That is the only mode, it's the only route to a medical parole application. It's the only route you can follow, not, se not 75. You will find no reference in, to 75 in this regulation. An application for medical parole in terms of section 79.2 shall be initiated by the completion of the applicable form as contained in Schedule B. Then three, when the head of a correctional services centre receives an application for medical parole, he or she must refer the application to the correctional medical practitioner, who is a correctional services official, justice, who must make an evaluation of the application in accordance with the provisions of section 79, once again, and make a recommendation. Then four, the recommendation must be submitted, once again, to the board, who must make a recommendation to the national sorry, to the Medical Parole Advisory Board, which is the board at issue here, which must make a recommendation to the National Commissioner, the Parole Board, or the Minister, once again, as the case may be. Now, subregulation 5 of Regulation 29A has a list of dread diseases and conditions. And what this regulation contemplates is that, prima facie, if you're suffering from one of these, Justice, you will it will be possible for you to be considered for medical parole as you would almost certainly fall within the ambit of 791A, i.e. a terminal condition or physical incapacity. And I'm not going to run through them, but they contain a veritable list of dread diseases, including stage 4 cancer, um, AIDS, um, cardiac disease with multiple organ failure and the like. Now, um, sub 6 says the board the Medical Advisory Board may consider any other condition not listed in subregulation 5 if it complies once again with the principles contained in se section 79 of the Act. In other words, if you are either terminally ill or physically incapacitated, so as you bring yourself within the ambit of 791A, then that could be considered even if it's not one of these conditions. Now, here is the crucial provision which we say puts an end to the respondent's case. The Medical Parole Advisory Board, this is sub-7, must make a recommendation to the National Commissioner, the Parole Board or the Minister, once again as the case may be, on the appropriateness to grant medical parole in accordance with Section 791A of the Act. Not Section 75, but Section 791A. Couldn't be clearer. And here is the provision. If the recommendation, if the recommendation of the Medical Advisory Board is positive, then the National Commissioner, the Board or the Minister, as the case may be, must consider whether the conditions stipulated 
in 791 B and C, i.e. the non-medical provisions are present. Now, nothing could be clearer, and we are not for a moment suggesting justice, as I think we may be criticized for doing, that you interpret the provisions of the Act in terms of regulations. You can't do that. That's against legal principle. We're not submitting that. We're submitting something different. We say that the drafters of the regulations, subsequently approved by Parliament, understand quite correctly the Act as we do, and in the only manner that it can be understood. There's only one route to medical parole, that's 79. And if you don't comply with 79, you're out. And in order to comply with 79, you must also comply with the regulations, and in particular, Regulation 29A7, which was not complied with deliberately and unambiguously by the um, authorities. In conclusion on this point, before I go on to the facts, <coughs> just, just make the point, and I'm not, I don't have the time to go there, but nowhere you, you will search the two sets of answering affidavits. You will not find any assertion in those documents that as a fact, Mr. Zuma is suffering either from a terminal condition or from physical incapacity so as to render him within the scope of 79-1A. And we submit the court, in fact, on the latter aspect, can take judicial cognizance of the fact. Well, first, it's a legal submission. Secondly, the judicial cognizance. The first point is, as I've already submitted, Mr. Zuma would have, upon his admission to escort correctional facility, un have undergone a health status examination. That was, he did, it's in the papers, I'm told. And that would have been on the 8th of July the early hours of the 8th of July, or maybe the 9th of July. What is significant, Justice, is the papers are silent on any, in fact, don't suggest at all the answering affidavits and the documents put up as part of the redacted record do not suggest that any life-threatening condition was detected on the 8th of July when Mr. Zuma was admitted. But suddenly, we know from the papers, the Commission's affidavit says on the 23rd of July, Mr. Zuma's condition began deteriorating, and then there were a series of medical reports and interventions. But the point is, as I'll show you in a moment, his condition had been deteriorating. Whatever his condition is, it had been on the decline since 2018 in terms of Dr. Martha's report. There was no sudden onset on these papers. There was no sudden onset of a terminal condition or physical incapacity. And on the latter score, Justice, the judicial cognizance. You, with respect, can take judicial cognizance of the fact that Mr. Zuma is on the public stage just before his admission to, to, to prison. He conducted a very uh, well-publicized um, press conference at his home in Nkandla without a mask, flanked by his legal representatives. He was in a, if I may say, a combative mood. He was defiant of the Constitutional Court to the end. There was absolutely and is absolutely no indication that he is physically incapacitated as required by 791A. After his release on medical parole, again, well publicized, he visited a casino in, 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 in Durban, Justice, in order to meet political um, um, allies. Absolutely, he was seen leaving his vehicle, going into the casino, coming out with files under his arm, etc. Absolutely no indication of physical incapacity. Um, that is the statutory architecture of the Act. If I can now take the court, and I don't have much time on the facts, but if I can take the court to our supplementary filing affidavit justice and to DA 17, which is the application by Dr. Martha. Now, in preparing for the matter, it occurred to me that, Matt, can I ask the court, do you have it? It's at case lines 5-89, Dr. Martha's report. Yes, yes. Do you have it, Justice? Yes, I have it. As the court is. Just as this document upon um, closer scrutiny is actually, even though we put it up as one document, sorry, God, even though we put it up as one document, it's actually two documents. The document you find at 589 is the Schedule B document referred to in Regulation 29A 
um, two. So this is actually the application for Medical World, this page. And then the document from 90 onward, 590, you'll see at the top, addendum to the medical parole application form and then C, medical report. This is the document contemplated in um, sub-regulations three and four of 29A. This is the recommendation, or, or sorry, this is the evaluation of the application for medical parole. Um, rather incongruously, since Dr. Martha undertook the evaluation, which you found from 90 onward, he also made the application, which suggests some degree of conflict. But that's not a point we've taken in the papers. So I don't make any submissions in that regard. If I can ask the court to go to page 90, and you will find the first important question, Justice, is to be found at D at the bottom. Now, this is a form. We don't know the provenance of this form. It was presumably drawn up by a functionary in the executive. It doesn't have legal force, the form. And it can't be used to interpret the act, let alone the regulations. But the question asked is, is the offender suffering from a terminal disease or condition which is chronic, is progressive, has deteriorated permanently, or reached an irreversible state? Now, the answers to this uh, question, as inelegantly framed as it is, are significant. Before I get to the answers, can I just make the point, Justice, that this question appears to be attempting to ascertain matters relating to the suitability of an, an applicant for medical parole to be given medical parole. In other words, whether the applicant complies with 791A. But it does so in an unfortunate manner because it doesn't accurately or properly or completely track the requirements of 791A. So there is reference, for instance, to a terminal disease, which is one of the requirements. But then it goes on to chronic. Is a condition chronic? Is it progressive? Now, the word chronic is not a word that you will find in the Act or the regulations. So the introduction of that concept is confusing. And in fact, having a chronic disease, Justice, is generally the antithesis of having a terminal one. A terminal one is going to kill you in the long term or the short term. A chronic one, even though a very debilitating condition, you can live with for many years. So it's unclear why there's a reference to chronic. But in any event, in respect of the question, is the condition chronic? The answer Dr. Martha gives is yes. And then is it progressive? Again, he says yes. But then, significantly, very significantly, in response to the question, has it deteriorated permanently or reached an irreversible state? He does not say yes. He says deteriorated significantly. In other words, on Dr. Martha's own evaluation of the application, based on a medical report which we obviously haven't seen, because Mr. Zuma won't give it to us. The medical report is referenced in this very document, the two paragraphs above, C medical, C attached medical report, C attached medical report. But in answer to that very important question for purposes of this form, has it been a permanent or irreversible The deterioration? leaders of the two largest economies in their respective regions meeting on Tuesday to take stock of trade, investment and political relations between the two countries. Kenya being a member of the United Nations Security Council, global issues will also feature high during the meetings. For updates on...